what is transfer learning, how can you use it to build faster, more efficient machine learning models, and what are some of its drawbacks? We'll talk about all of that today in NLP for developers. Most often when people talk about transfer learning, what they mean is a way to take a model that has been trained to do some sort of task and then using that model to do a different task. The biggest reason people use transfer learning is that it's very expensive and slow to train a large model, particularly something like a transformer that has a lot of trainable parameters. By taking a pre-trained model and using it in a different way, you can do less training, which means you need to spend less time on compute and you have to do fewer rounds of training. And also you need less data because the pre-trained model has already been exposed to some data. So it has sort of a warm start when it comes to the second problem. There are two really common ways of doing this. The first is feature extraction. If you've been doing NLP, you've probably used this at some point. You have some text input, it goes through a pre-trained model, or it might get features out of a pre-trained model. Uh, and then those features are used as input to a task specific model. So an example of this would be something like a word vector where you have uh, you know, a tensor of uh, vectors for each of your words and you look up the vector for the word that you're currently using and then concatenate those together and pass that on to your pre-trained model. Another common approach is fine tuning. So you take your pre-trained model, you unfreeze a couple of layers near the top, or you add an additional couple of layers on top of the existing model, you train those, and then you use that whole model uh, to give you your final output for whatever type of task it is that you're working on. One term you'll hear a lot when talking about pre-trained models and transfer learning is one shot or few shot, um, sometimes even zero shot. And the shot here requires refers to how many pieces of data you need to expose your model to before it can do the task you're trying to get it to do. Another quick terminology note, in the transfer learning literature, uh, knowledge means something very different than it does in the NLU literature. Um, and when they overlap, sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. In transfer learning, knowledge means trained model weights, usually if they're talking about a neural model, which almost always they are. In NLU, knowledge usually means some sort of structured data representation that represents the semantic relationships of objects in the world, for example, knowing that a cat is a type of animal. How are transfer learning paradigms used? So the biggest way is to save time and money, to use a model that can already do a little bit of what you want it to do, and then using that to make your task easier. So some common examples would be things like word vectors that are taken from a pre-trained model, um, language models, including neural language models like BERT or GPT-3, and things like cross-lingual transfer learning, where you take a model trained on one language and apply it to another language. The big benefits, like I mentioned, are saving time and money. If you can use transfer learning for your particular project, I would urge you to do so. Uh, and another big benefit is that you don't need as much data because the model that you're starting with has already been trained to a certain extent. You only need some additional data to help train it for the specific thing that you're doing with it. There are some drawbacks, however. So a big one is that transfer learning tends to work best the more like your current task, the task the model was initially trained on. There is kind of a way to get around this, and that's by training a model that does an enormous variety of different things or has seen a large amount of different data and a sort of general purpose. So that's the general idea between something behind something like BERT or GPT-3, is that you have had a model that has looked at so much language data and has um, you know, encountered it in so many different domains and genres that the likelihood that it's going to have some sort of idea of what you're doing with your text in your domain and genre is you know, pretty high. Um, if you are trying to train such a general purpose model yourself, uh, it takes a lot of data and a lot of training and the resulting model will probably be quite big. Uh, my recommendation is usually to take a, uh, if you're going to use a pre-trained model, try to find one that's as like the task that you're doing as possible. And finally, using a pre-trained model means that any biases or trends that were found in the corpus that your data, uh, that your original model was trained on will also show up in your final model. You're sort of taking on, yes, all of the benefits of the model already being trained, but also all the drawbacks of the model already being trained. So some common errors and gotchas 
a really big one is picking a pre-trained model that's not a good fit for your current task. Um, so for example, if you have a pre-trained model that was trained on, let's say, newspaper text, which at least in the United States tends to be very formal. Uh, a lot of models have been trained on the Wall Street Journal text. There's a big corpus of it. And then you try to apply that to say something like text messaging data, your model's probably not going to work very well uh, because the ways that people use language in the Wall Street Journal and the ways that people use language when they're texting each other are very different. You'd be better off trying to find a model already trained on texting data. Another common error is if you're using a pre-trained model, it's going to have uh, certain assumptions about the way the data will be presented to it. So uh, particularly if you are doing the fine tuning approach, you need to make sure that the pipeline that you're using is the same as the pipeline used to originally train the model. Depending on what the model is, you're probably going to have to look at the documentation for that model to figure out what that is. A couple more resources. Vincent, who you may be familiar with from the channel, has a uh, algorithms whiteboard video on bias in word embeddings. And he is talking about word embeddings particularly there, but that should apply to any sort of model that you're using in a pre-trained setting. And also we have a talk from last year from Hugging Face about their model hub. So this is a collection of models that they have and different tools for running experiments with them and perhaps integrating them into your own work. Thanks so much for joining me today on NLP for Developers. I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, and I will say that the term transfer learning is used to mean more different types of approaches in machine learning than just the two that I outlined here. But I would say that these are probably the most common and generally when most people say transfer learning, they would agree that both of these things definitely are transfer learning. Thanks for joining me. Uh, I look forward to seeing what you build and I'll see you later.